Review copy provided by Nintendo. Thanks, Nintendo! Hello, my friends, Arlo here, and today we're reviewing... Hey, where's my graphic? And the rest of the, uh, world. Huh. Oh, no, don't tell me. Yep. I'm dead. Dead as a doornail. Oh, man, it was the hype again, wasn't it? I can't even believe that. Dying of hype twice in one year. Tell me about it. I need to send Nintendo a thank you card or a gift basket or something. <sighs> well, this review is really, really important. Uh, can I at least use that PC and recording equipment you got sitting out over there till we can get all this sorted out? I did not mean to leave that out. <laughs> yeah, nice kitty stickers. You starting your own YouTube channel or something? SILENCE! Yes. Hey, good on you! What kind of channel? Mostly Let's Plays with occasional vlogs and theories. Uh, but enough! In order to assuage the awkwardness of the situation, I will grant you your request. As long as you don't complain about the motion controls the whole time. Oh, thanks, man. I promise I won't. <laughs> you are a liar. That's what I would have said to you two years ago if you told me we'd be getting a game like Odyssey anytime soon, or really ever. I was sure that I had Nintendo pegged. I was sure that Sandbox Mario was done for. Mario had returned to what makes a Mario game really a Mario game, pure platforming and little else, and I didn't think anything would ever change that. And I lamented the loss of the type of Mario game I preferred in my video in defense of Super Mario Sunshine. If you told me that not only would we be getting the biggest, most creative and ambitious Mario game ever conceived by a huge margin, but we would be able to play it anywhere, well, I would have looked you right in the eyes, shook my head slowly, and said, You sicken me. You weave a wicked web of lies, and I pity you. And yet, here we are. Super Mario Odyssey was announced, and it came out, and I played it, and it still doesn't even feel real. It's like a loved one thought lost at sea years ago, found safe and sound, and stuffed with moons. I don't really know how to properly tell you about the game without spoiling too much. Not that there's anything left to be spoiled if you watched all the game's trailers, but that's a topic for another day. I'm gonna do my best though, and to be extra safe, I'm only gonna be showing off footage from the first three kingdoms. The Hat Kingdom, which is the very first place you hit and acts mostly as a tutorial. The Cascade Kingdom, which is a bigger world, but greatly limits the number of moons you can get your first time through, making it something of an extension of the tutorial, and the Sand Kingdom, which is the first big, full world you can run around in. Oh man, where do I even start with a game like this? Where do I start with a game where this is a thing? Y y you want a review? Here's your review! Review over! Well, might as well start with the story as it sets up this whole bizarre scenario. I'm one of those rare few who really cares about having a story in a Mario game. That's another thing I talk about in that Sunshine video. I fully understand that Mario doesn't need a super deep and involved story, but I need enough of one to make the game more interesting. Uh, I'm a big feel guy. I want a game to feel cool. Bowser grabbing Peach and running away for the millionth time and that's it is not cool. It, it doesn't feel like anything. I have no motivation beyond, this is a Mario game, shut up and play it. And I know every Mario story really boils down to Bowser kidnapping Peach, but throwing in some extra elements makes all the difference. Mario is vacationing on an island where some weird shadow version of himself is wreaking havoc and making a mess, so in addition to gathering up all the shines, you're tasked by the people there with, quote, cleaning up the place. Bowser kidnaps Peach and takes a spaceship to the center of the universe to create his own galaxy, and on the way there you learn the backstory of the mysterious space-traveling woman who aids you on your quest. That's motivation, that's creativity, that's feel. It's what I crave when I'm stomping Goombas and trying to go rescue Peach. Going into Odyssey, I knew the basic premise, but I didn't know how it would ultimately be executed. I'm extremely pleased to say though, the game delivers exactly what I hope for in a Mario game. And a quick note, if you consider the opening cinematic a spoiler, you might want to skip ahead a few minutes, but it's pretty short, and again, there's nothing in it that Nintendo didn't show in the trailers. I love the opening because it doesn't start the way the other games do. It doesn't start with Mario sleeping on a log, and a toad comes along and gives him a letter from Peach, inviting him to eat some cake at the castle, and just before he gets there, oh no, Bowser crashes a party and grabs Peach and takes off with her, and you gotta give chase. No, it starts you in the middle of the action. You're already on Bowser's airship, already facing him down. Seeing his get up and hearing one or two lines of dialogue lets you know he plans to marry Peach. 
This right here might seem like a small detail, but in a way I feel like the sudden start sets the tone for the rest of the game. It says, this Mario game is a little different. We're doing away with some of the fluff and rethinking the way things should play out. We don't need to see all that stuff leading up to this scene. We all know how it goes. Let's just start where things get interesting. So Bowser just completely messes up Mario's day and sends him plummeting to the land below, his famous red cap in tatters. He wakes up in a weird place and falls in with one of the resident ghosty McHat faces. This guy, Cappy, wants to help you out so he can save his sister, who Bowser just snaps to use as Peach's wedding tiara. And while I'll talk more about the visual aspect later, I want to emphasize once again how the game establishes a tone right at the beginning of the story. Think first area in a Mario game. What are you imagining? Probably green grass, hills, sunny sky, maybe some Goombas hanging around. Something a little more plain and Mario-like to start the player at ground level and work up to the more interesting stuff from there. Well, look at Odyssey's starting area. Whites and blacks and grays, top hats, ghosts, the moon, an ocean of mist surrounded by a distant city. What a bizarre place to start a Mario game. And once again, this says something. This says, what formula? This Mario game is whatever it wants to be. This Mario game is full of surprises. After this point, you find an airship of your own and move from kingdom to kingdom, gathering up enough power moons to finally catch up with Bowser. Again, yes, this is just Bowser kidnapping Peach and you chasing him, but it keeps you engaged throughout the game. Bowser's got business in each kingdom, motivating you to travel to each one. There are encounters and story beats that happen between kingdoms. And this is how you have a great story in a Mario game, even if it's the same story. There's nothing worse than a game just being one straight shot to the end. Even with non-Mario games, I just hate it when everything gets set up and every level is just an obstacle on your way to the end encounter, leaving you with a story that's essentially a beginning and an end with literally no middle. That was a big problem with Sticker Star, in fact. It wasn't just that the story was generic, it was that nothing interesting happened plot-wise on your way to the end. But Odyssey serves as a perfect example of how Bowser kidnapping Peach can be entertaining no matter how many times we go through it, as long as some care is given to making it interesting. Plus, to cap it all off, no pun intended, the entire ending sequence is far and away the best ending to any non-RPG Mario. I don't want to hype it up too much, but I thought it was just phenomenal. It made me laugh out loud multiple times, and in fact, the game overall is just packed with humor. For a few of these gags and witticisms, we're talking Paper Mario levels of funny. One thing that really aids in the storytelling, naturally, is the game's cutscenes. Mario games are always animated very well, but Odyssey is on another level in this regard. Animations are natural and fluid, the characters are very expressive, and most obviously, the game was given more of a cinematic flair. Again, this is obvious from the very first cutscene. It's just so much fun to watch. The visuals in general are really stellar. I mean, what do you expect? This is Mario. Is there any other series that Nintendo polishes like they polish Mario? Starting in the Cap Kingdom didn't just set the mood for the game. It also served as a way to showcase the game's graphics, or rather, not showcase them. See, the first cutscene looks great, but once gameplay starts, you're in this place that's designed wonderfully from an artistic perspective, no doubt, but not much of it impresses on a technical level. The colors are muted, there isn't a whole lot of texturing to admire, it's pretty simple. Pleasant, but simple. I believe that this was purposeful, because once you leave, you're smacked right in the face with the Cascade Kingdom, and you really realize how gorgeous the game is. Colors are vibrant, textures are sharp. I mean, look at the scuffed up shine on this chain chump, or the skin on this T-Rex. Ah, I love it. Basically, any character or baddie you meet features such intricate little details that make them come alive. It's funny because these are all essentially cartoon characters, but when they're made to move this fluidly and they're covered in textures that look so genuine you think you could reach out and feel them, they seem real, like they're not just cartoon characters. Games like Super Mario 3D World and Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle look really nice, but the characters are given a shiny, plasticky sheen that makes them look like toys, which is pleasant in its own sort of way, but I vastly prefer the more realistic shading and rendering in Odyssey. It's like Nintendo has been experimenting with how to make a cartoony series like Mario more graphically impressive for quite a while now. How do you make a cartoon look better without just making it shinier and smoother? Well, if you ask me, they've arrived. This is perfection, and beyond finer environmental details like grass and particle effects and whatnot, it's hard to imagine a Mario game looking much better than this. And it ain't just pure graphical power, of course. This game is a work of art. I want so badly to go on and on about all the kingdoms and how insanely creative and visually spectacular some of them are, and yeah, I know you've probably seen them all anyway in the trailers, but I'll contain myself. We'll stick to the first three, but let me just tell you, there's some incredible stuff in this game. One thing I loved about Sunshine was that Isle Delphine felt like a real place, and in the background you could always see some other part of the island. Then, of course, you'd have special levels with bizarro backgrounds just to change things up. I love the island, though. I love having a sense of place. Being grounded in that way allows for greater feelings of awe and mystery. Look at the style of 3D World and 3D Land as an example of something I'm less interested in, where every level is a bizarro level. Just a collection of platforms floating above an endless expanse of nothing with random geometric shapes in the
the background. No one lives in these places. They really just exist so you can jump around on them. Galaxy kind of straddles the line. You can always see other galaxies and stars and stuff in the background, which is certainly fun. It makes me wonder what I might find if I could fly to those other places. However, most of the levels in those games are still just collections of stuff to jump around on. The Honey Hive Galaxy is about the closest thing to a real place with real inhabitants that you'll get. Usually when you meet NPCs, they're just sort of hanging around on platforms or tiny planetoids, and it's like, do you live here? Where do you, where do you sleep? How do you get food? But Odyssey, once again, is everything I could have wanted in this regard. Nearly every kingdom has a race of inhabitants that really and truly live there. They have houses, you can talk to them, their worlds are actually affected by Bowser's actions. These places have a reason for being other than so Mario can jump on them. And that sense of reality motivates me to move forward and, like I said, deepens the sense of mystery I feel. It gets me wondering more than ever about the stuff I find. It gets me wondering what's beyond the world I can interact with. And so much of this is thanks to the game's backgrounds. Most kingdoms are surrounded by gorgeous scenery. Just look at what I am showing you on the screen right now. Look at that! Is this a Mario game I'm playing? Then look at the Cap Kingdom, surrounded by a gigantic city, presumably inhabited by the Hattie McSpook floats. My gosh, it's enormous! How many people live there? What's their society like? And is that the Cascade Kingdom hanging out below the moon? How the heck does that work? W what's it like in the space between them? And the cool thing is that, yeah, just like with Sunshine, you'll still find a ton of special, smaller, self-contained stages that can be anything they want visually. Many of them are indeed bizarro collections of platforms out in nowhere land, but so many of them still have some link to reality, or at least contain some visual detail that makes them more interesting. You'll see cool stuff in the background, and instead of simply saying, I am nowhere, and getting on with your day, you'll say, where am I? Between the backgrounds and the music and the game's use of color and lighting, Odyssey often works to establish, <gasps> surely you can't be serious. Atmosphere in a Mario game? That's right. Everything isn't just bright and bubbly and goofy. It's never downright dire or anything, but so many areas can be a little eerie, a little weird, or really just atmospheric. Even an otherwise normal area can have a whole different feel just because the sun is setting. And it's these little details that make the game so engrossing, that make it consistently enjoyable to just be in. If pure gameplay was the main reason to be in Mario's world in the past, now taking in the environments is half the fun. They truly are magical. And while we're still talking about visuals, we might as well touch on performance. The game runs at a solid 60 FPS, making every motion very smooth. The downside to that, though, is that the resolution is less smooth. The game tops out at 900p when docked, and this of course means a decent amount of rough edges. Much like other first-party Switch titles, it uses dynamic resolution scaling to keep the frame rate consistent, but it's much more noticeable in Odyssey than it was in, say, Splatoon. In busier places, NPCs in the distance use fewer frames of animation before they pop out of existence. Uh, you'll see little bits of the world get a little wonky on occasion if you're looking closely enough. The most obvious scaling happens when you move the camera around. Instead of using motion blur as a cinematic element, the game's version of motion blur is really just more downscaling. As in, you're not looking at a blur effect, but a lower resolution image, presumably to make up for the fact that the world around you has to load more quickly with fast camera motions. Sometimes I see it happening pretty clearly, but most of the time I don't notice. It's really impressive how the game can adapt so quickly and find so many little corners to cut to keep the action running smoothly, though I do wish we had an option to favor either frame rate or resolution, as many other games have. If we're talking shooters like Splatoon, then yeah, give me 60 FPS, no doubt. But with a 3D platformer, I really don't think the frame rate does anything for my accuracy. It looks nice, sure, but it would look even nicer with smooth edges and minimal jaggies. The world is so beautiful, I would much prefer a crisp 1080p image running at 30 FPS. But hey, that's just me and I know I'm in the minority here. Surely though, by now you're asking the big question, how do it go? How's the gameplay and all that jumping around we've been talking about? Well, let's start with the basics. If you played Super Mario 64, you know more or less what to expect. You can crouch, backflip, wall jump, ground pound, sideways somersault, long jump, and triple jump, just like the good old days. Though some of the moves have a feel unique to Odyssey. You might remember me saying in my first impressions video that triple jumping is much easier than it's ever been. It no longer requires such precise timing and alignment to pull off, which makes it much more usable. One casualty this time around, though, is the sideways somersault. There have always been a number of ways to jump higher than you can with a normal jump, be it a sideways somersault, a triple jump, or a backflip, but the sideways somersault has always been my favorite. It doesn't require the space and the timing of the triple jump, and it keeps your momentum versus the backflip, which requires you to stop and line up the shot. You just start moving away from the platform, and boom, you're launching yourself up. It's always just felt really good. However, this time, for whatever reason, I feel like they made it harder to pull off consistently. I just can't do it with the casual ease I'm used to. It's not super hard or anything, but even just that extra little bit of difficulty means I can't rely on it a lot, or else I'm gonna miss a bunch of jumps. 
Fortunately, the game introduces a new type of high jump where you jump coming out of a ground pound to get some extra air, and this provides a nice sort of middle ground. It's slower than the sideways somersault, but not as momentum halting as the backflip. It's a nice addition to Mario's moveset, truth be told. I'm definitely glad it's there. Another addition is the roll. Technically, this was used in 3D Land and 3D World, but this time you can roll continuously, and it's a relatively simple addition that makes moving Mario around a lot more fun. There's just something very satisfying about gaining some extra speed by rolling down a hill, or better yet, a series of hills. You know Mario doesn't just jump and tumble in this game though. Hit the Y button and you'll throw Cappy, and this is where things get interesting. First off, this is your main mode of interacting with the world. You chuck him around and he hooks onto stuff to varying effect. Turning on lights, pushing stuff around, repelling projectiles. Cappy can be used to break stuff, and you can even hold down the button to keep him hovering for a few seconds, causing continuous damage. More interesting though is how he enhances your ability to move around. Throwing him while in midair will give you just a little extra airtime, much like the spin move in Super Mario Galaxy. It's not nearly as challenge removing as the spin was, it's really just a tiny bit of movement, but I'm still so thankful for it. I don't want the game to play itself for me, and precise platforming is part of the whole challenge, but that little inch of forgiveness makes the whole experience so much more enjoyable and smooth. There's a lot more though, run into Cappy while he's hovering and you'll get launched higher than a regular jump. It's still not the perfect solution to a more finicky sideways somersault, seeing as if you're too close to a wall Mario won't throw him, but it's another move that certainly helps. Then you can throw him out into the open air and bounce on top of him to gain some extra distance, though landing that bounce can be trickier than it looks. If you ground pound but press Y before you start to fall, you vault forward, much like Mario did in 64 and Sunshine when you jumped and hit B. You don't gain a ton of horizontal distance and you fall at a very severe angle, but it's another bit of wiggle room that I'm extremely thankful for. You're no longer such a slave to gravity. If you don't line up your jump perfectly, there are now ways you can turn things around. Then string all these moves together and Mario's more mobile than he's been since he had the flood strapped to his back. You can throw Cappy basically at any time and if you dive into him, you'll get an extra bounce as you would expect. So after playing around for a while, you discover that you've got the ability to move insanely long horizontal distances. At least insanely long compared to most passes games where you had the long jump and that was that. Here you can long jump, throw Cappy, dive into him and bounce, throw him again, then dive again, all in one move. Now I could easily see a Mario veteran hearing all this and thinking, wow, looks like they removed all the challenge, giving Mario all these moves, letting him jump so far, they might as well make him fly. The thing is though, these new moves are tools. They're not free passes. They don't make the game easier. In fact, you've got to still be good at thinking on your feet as they often require split second timing to pull off. I still haven't mastered the controls. I still forget to use certain moves and fail to execute a lot of the ones I try. It's a system that offers more options and interactions than Mario's ever had, thus a relatively complicated one, and instead of making up for bad playing, it rewards those willing to master it with fewer deaths and more fluid movement. It's without a doubt the deepest moveset we've seen in a Mario game. It benefits tremendously from practice and experimentation. Cappy's got a few more things he can do, but we're gonna hold off on talking about that until later and instead move on to your objective. Instead of stars or shine sprites or flagpoles, Odyssey sees you collecting power moons. And of course, the game returns to the more open sandbox style of 64 and Sunshine versus the linear get to the goal style we saw in Mario's of the last decade. The difference here is that there's a greater emphasis than ever on that sandbox element, and there are a million moons. Instead of entering a stage with a specific moon in mind, with the stage often changing based on which one you're after, the moons are all available to you, with a few exceptions, and you don't get booted out of the level when you grab one. This is the first truly open Mario experience ever created, and that sense of freedom is exhilarating. These worlds are just jam, stinking, packed with stuff to do and find. Offering so many moons versus a 120 or whatever was a genius stroke of game design because it means that you're always finding something useful. The fact that there are a million moons should in theory make each one less valuable than a star or a shine sprite, but it doesn't feel that way, at least not to me. I get moons constantly and every single one feels great. Mini games, hidden secrets, item fetching, it doesn't matter one lick what it is. If it nets me a moon, I'm happy to have done it. Lots of moons are barely hidden at all and take little to no effort to get beyond just finding them, but I still get that tiny any little rush when I pick them up. If nabbing a star in the other games was satisfying, then this is that feeling times five or six or seven. I don't even know how many moons there are. I've got 500 and there are some worlds I've barely touched. Even better though, these moons aren't just satisfying to earn, they're fun to earn. See, back in my day, 100%ing a Mario game meant doing all the challenges that were fun, then slowly grinding through all the tedious ones, hopefully reaching the end before realizing your time is more important than that and quitting out of frustration. 
Collecting a hundred coins in a level where one tiny mistake means starting all over, hunting down a preposterous number of blue coins, each with an annoying timed hide-and-seek thing to go with it, floating down an impossible river of poison for the rest of your life because it's impossible! I love 64 and Sunshine, but not all of their challenges were designed with fun in mind. The Galaxy games were certainly better in this regard. The levels being mostly linear platforming affairs meant you were never forced to do anything too tedious or time-consuming, though there were plenty of trickster comet levels I just didn't feel like dealing with and put off as long as I could. Odyssey, on the other hand, is always a joy to play. Nintendo focused so hard on filling the game with challenges that were first and foremost fun that you're talking about a game that's basically all highs and no lows. Now, as I said, I haven't gotten every moon, far from it, and for all I know, there are some that are completely unfair and take way too much time to get, but it says something when a guy can get 500 of them without finding any of them unpleasant. So far, there have been no long sequences where messing up and starting all over. There have been no grueling collectathons. There have been no levels that were so hard I threw up my hands and called it quits. I've come upon some that were hard, definitely, and there are some as of yet unfinished ones that are so hard I've been working up the courage to try them again, but we're talking hard here, not unfair, not tedious, not something that wastes your time or just wants to kill you stupidly for the sake of keeping you away from that precious game completion a little longer. If I have a hard time with a challenge, it's because it requires more skill, more practice, and a better understanding of how it should be done. And when I finally conquer that challenge, I feel nothing but a great feeling of pride and accomplishment. On the subject of difficulty as a whole, Odyssey strikes a pretty good balance. I will say that most of the time it does lean on the easy side, and there were times in my initial run-through when some sort of challenge was so fun that I wished it was a little harder. Much of the first chunk of moons you need to beat the game can be breezed through without too much difficulty. However, that's not to say that there weren't a few things I had to try a good number of times. As you'd expect, the smaller secret levels are generally where you'll be challenged the most, as they're usually focused on that pure platforming that Galaxy and 3D World fans will appreciate. These don't offer checkpoints, so a fall does mean starting all over, but they're never so long that it's a big problem. Up in the kingdom proper, moons are generally easier to get, though simply finding them all is sort of the challenge. Figuring out how to get a moon can be its own kind of hard. One great thing is that if you get really stuck hunting for those last few moons, you can get a hint from this guy for 50 coins, or for free from this robot if you've got some amiibo lying around. This isn't like Skyward Sword though, where the game literally shows you a video of exactly where a thing is and how to get it. It marks the moon's location on your map, but if you've already grabbed all the obvious moons, chances are that the hint is going to be just that. A hint. It'll point you in the right direction, but in most cases, I still found myself having to figure out what to do. It's a system that can offer help to younger players if they should want it for earlier moons, and at the same time, it can nudge more experienced ones in the right direction while they're doing cleanup so they don't have to spend an eternity running around getting nowhere or give up and look up an explicit answer online. The game caters to different experience levels even further by offering what it calls assist mode, which points to objectives and bounces Mario back if he falls. Some will lament that such a mode exists and that my three-year-old nephew should simply get good, but I think it's a great option that opens the game up to players that might otherwise not be fit to handle it. So uh, let's back up a little bit. Do you remember earlier when I said you could buy hints with coins? Yeah, you did hear me right. This is a Mario game, a platformy one, not an RPG one, where you can buy stuff with your coins. They're no longer just something to collect a hundred of to earn an extra life. In fact, forget about lives entirely. They ain't in this game. If there's something that really makes you realize how deeply they pondered the Mario formula here, it's getting rid of lives. Lives make little sense in modern Mario, and I say good riddance. Now when you die, you lose coins. Pretty funny turn of events if you ask me. And compared to lives, this feels like an actual punishment for losing. It's a very real motivation to not die. Every time I see that coin counter go down, I wince a little. That's because coins can be used to buy a number of things. Mainly you've got costumes, and going in, I really didn't think I would care about these, but before I knew it, I was proudly sporting some silly outfit and saving up to get more. Changing Mario's look just does a lot more to keep things fun and interesting than I expected. Though I will say that it would have been nice if some of these outfits provided even tiny bonuses. Slight environmental resistances, minor adjustments to your moveset or how enemies interact with you, that sort of thing. As it is, they can get you some moons, but beyond that, they don't really do anything themselves. They're just kind of fun. Coins can also be used to buy temporary heart extensions, which are handy if you're going into a tricky boss battle, and most importantly, you can use them to buy moons. So, hey, that's that's all the incentive you need right there. Arlo's love collecting money and buying stuff, so the fact that this has been introduced into a Mario game is just a dream come true. It's never been more fun and satisfying to collect coins. It's no longer something that's enjoyable almost entirely because it makes a sparkle and a fun little bling sound. In addition to regular old coins, most kingdoms have a unique currency that can 
can be used to buy kingdom-specific items in the shop. Within a world, there are always exactly the right number of these you need to buy all the unique items, which include costumes and both stickers and souvenirs that decorate your ship, the Odyssey. Having a limited number of these special coins with a very clear indication of how many you've gotten and how many are left makes them yet another fun thing to hunt down. The stuff they buy is all optional, purely for collectors, or at least almost purely for collectors, but hey, no spoilers here. So once again, I went in thinking I wouldn't care, but now I'm way into getting it all. Seeing as the game looked so big and was focusing so much on exploration, I think I expected more stuff to collect overall, though the designers chose to have these coins pretty much be the extent of what you collect outside of moons. Instead of finding all sorts of stuff out in the world, you just find these special coins, which in turn buy all the collectibles. And there's a part of me that was hoping for a little more, maybe hoping to some times find something completely unexpected, but I can't deny that this is a cleaner and more streamlined way of doing it. Plus, I guess I'd rather have that thrill of finding the last few coins I need to buy a hat rather than just finding the hat up in a tree because, well, <laughs> that's the fun, making me run around all over the place. And speaking of running around all over the place, I'm so good at segues, <laughs> I'm like a pro. Let's talk a little about hub worlds. As we found out some time ago, there ain't one. Naturally, Odyssey having a hub world was something I was hoping for, as I loved the ones in both 64 and Sunshine, but the game looked so good that the bad news wasn't too bad at all. And I just want to tell you now how after playing the game, it even more doesn't matter than I thought it would doesn't matter. I really had to explore these big worlds for myself to put together why that is. See, I loved Peach's Castle and Isle Delfino for three reasons. One, they were like big playgrounds for me to run around in between levels, just something to have some silly fun with. Two, they offered the most in terms of exploration. The hub was where you found all the levels and most of the secrets. Three, they acted as something of a creative nexus for all the levels to connect to, making the world feel like more of a real place rather than just a collection of isolated levels. Most of Odyssey's worlds meet every one of these criteria. They're big and filled with stuff to play around with, they're obviously overflowing with secrets, and they already feel so real that I don't need them to be connected to each other. I generally don't like choosing levels on a world map because it makes the game seem less like another world and more like a game. But despite the fact that you can't even call what Odyssey has a world map because it's really just a list, it doesn't feel like I'm picking from a collection of levels. It feels like I'm picking regions on a great big awesome planet. They're so substantial and creative that it would almost feel wrong trying to staple them to each other just for the sake of having a hub world. So yeah, no problems there is what I'm trying to say. So that brings us to Odyssey's biggest strengths. I've already gone on about how creative it is, but I really can't stress it enough. Odyssey is just bursting with creativity and charm. No other Mario game has ever come close to this level. And that's something I really value in a game. It's the reason Thousand Year Door is one of my favorite games of all time. All the weird, interesting environments and races and scenarios. When you take another step back, Linear Mario vs. Sandbox Mario isn't just a matter of pure platforming versus exploration, but it's also sort of like design versus imagination. The technical aspect of creating and mapping out a gameplay challenge versus dreaming up stuff that would just be cool to do and see. Both can be important parts of game design, but different games prioritize the two differently, and Odyssey leans more on that latter side, to a degree that I never could have hoped for. When I look at the game, I don't just see a bunch of guys hunched over their computers, writing code and tweaking platform distances. I see people sitting around a table, bouncing around ideas, drawing, letting their imaginations run wild. I mean, you can be a T-Rex for Pete's sake. <laughs> if that doesn't say creativity, nothing in this great big world does. Then, to reference my Sunshine video one more time, there's another reason I love that game significantly more than Galaxy and 3D World, and that's gameplay variety. I think the Galaxy games in particular are technically superior games. They're more focused and consistent and just better from a game design standpoint. Yet I find myself returning to 64 and Sunshine way more often because of the wide range of stuff the games have me do. Instead of just getting to the end of the path and maybe beating a boss, you've got to find something, or solve a puzzle, or gather stuff, or just anything. Even if some of the challenges are less well designed than others, I still find myself more engaged. It's just the way my brain works, I crave differing objectives. It's more stimulating to me. And as you could probably tell from everything else I've said, Odyssey sets the bar high, high above any other Mario as far as variety goes. Part of that is thanks to the design of the worlds themselves, there are just so many moons and so many different ways to get them. But the biggest thing is the ability that I haven't even really touched on yet. Odyssey already wins the Best Mario Ever award purely because of all that other stuff, but putting the capture ability on top of it all? 
It's the icing on the cake. It's the meat on the sandwich. It takes a really great game and turns it into something truly remarkable. And that's, of course, because of the variety it adds. There are so many different baddies and even objects to capture, and each one has its own way of interacting with the world. And thanks to that Nintendo bankroll that says, we've got the money to polish this sucker until every piece of it is fun, nearly every capture is enjoyable to control. Lots of games have this problem where even if the main character controls all right, vehicles and transformations end up being nothing but frustrating. Take ukulele, for example. Making it feel good to run around with a character takes a lot of time and tweaking, so introducing other forms forms of movement often results in a wide assortment of inferior experiences. But just about none of Mario's captures are difficult or frustrating to control. Most of them have certain weaknesses and limitations, sure, but that's where the challenge lies, overcoming these limitations in order to utilize their unique strengths. And the same goes for vehicles. The Jaxi in the Sand Kingdom will send you flying off the edge of the world with great ease, and it's not great at making sharp turns, but it's blazing fast and can get you across the desert in no time flat. The controls are difficult to master, but they're responsive and intuitive, thus making falls feel completely fair. There's only one single thing that I thought had wonky controls, but it's from a later kingdom, so I won't talk about it here. It's really just the one, though, and it's not even the worst thing in the world or anything. It just has a weird element that makes it harder than it should be to operate. So now, unfortunately, to use another food analogy, we come to the fly in the soup, the motion controls. You'll remember from my first impressions video that I was pretty uneasy about them, and while in the end they don't break the game by any means, they're a very big disappointment. Let me take you through it. You can either press Y or shake your Joy-Con or Pro Controller to throw Cappy. You can shake again to have him home in on the nearest object, which helps people with subpar aim, like me. However, there's no button equivalent for homing. You can shake shake to home, but you can't press press to home. This is baffling. Furthermore, you can fling whatever you're holding up to throw Cappy up in the air or down to throw him down. These actions also have no direct button equivalents. You can ground pound, then hit Y to make Mario throw Cappy downward in that same vertical oriented way, but this only works when you're standing on a ledge. You can't use it to actually throw Cappy down while in midair, rendering it fairly useless. Then throwing it upward, forget it. There isn't even a halfway alternative. Then you've got the spin attack, which is really useful for taking out lots of little guys or collecting circles of coins. You do it by swinging whatever controller you're using like a doofus to one side or the other. If you're not into swinging around though, then the only way to make it happen is to stop and twirl the control stick around until Mario starts to spin, then press Y. Yes, technically this is an entirely non-motion controlled way to spin, but it takes so much longer and is so much more awkward to pull off that it's not worth it most of the time. And in cases like this, where you need to grab multiple things without stopping, swinging the controller is the only option that works. Lastly, there are a few captures that require Waggle to perform their best. The examples that will probably come up the most are frogs and Goombas, where you've got to swing upward to make them jump higher. None of this would be so bad if the Switch was purely a home console. I used motion controls in Super Mario Galaxy and they were fine. I got used to shaking the remote to do a spin attack and pointing at the screen to grab star bits and pull stuff around. I was always positioned in front of the TV anyway and it didn't matter how I sat with my remote as long as I could find the sensor bar because I never had to shake in a specific direction. But this isn't the Wii. This is the Switch, and Nintendo's whole thing with the Switch is providing gamers with options. The system allows you to play however you want with whatever controller you want, but when you're playing Odyssey in handheld mode, you are at a disadvantage. It's one thing to shake a detached Joy-Con or even a Pro Controller, but shaking the Switch itself feels awful. Aiming is no problem. Gyro aiming can be intuitive and it keeps the screen relatively steady, but having to jerk the whole thing suddenly to home in on an object or swing it upward to make your Goombas jump or whirl it from side to side to spin Cappy around makes no sense. It compromises your line of sight. It puts undue stress on your Joy-Cons. You can feel creaking around. It looks and feels stupid. It's just uncomfortable and it flies in the face of the idea that the Switch can be played anywhere and in any way that feels comfortable to you. And to make matters worse, the game doesn't compensate for whatever position you're in when you play. If you want these motion controls to work, you've got to be sitting upright. Holding two detached Joy-Cons just like the game suggests, but leaning back on your couch, the game ain't gonna know if you're trying to throw up or throw down or spin. Handheld mode, even worse in this regard. I spend most of my handheld time in bed lying on my back. Therefore, none of this works. I can sometimes get a spin to work, but a lot of the time the game thinks I'm trying to just throw Cappy while I'm moving to set up my big stupid arm motion. Then, even if you are sitting upright, don't move around too much or else the game is gonna think you're throwing when you're not and mess up your moves. Like I said, it doesn't completely break the game. What I've done to make my experience better is to lay out some rules for myself so that I'm 
I'm not constantly trying to fight with the controls and shaking them around all over the place. I always throw with Y, and in the off chance I want to home in on something, I give my controller or switch a quick downward shake. Throwing Cappy up or down is simply out of the question. Those are moves I just don't use. I can't use them most of the time. If I want to spin but I'm not in a hurry, I do it the manual way, and I've gotten a little better at pulling it off more fluidly. Then, in the cases where I need to spin quickly or make a capture jump extra high, I very carefully and purposefully fling my controller or switch in the proper direction. So basically, in order to make the game not frustrating, I've resigned to using certain moves rarely and grudgingly and other moves not at all. And if you ask me, this kind of compromise should not have to happen. Motion controls should be there to enhance an experience, not drag it down. Take Pikmin 3, for example. You can use nothing but the gamepad to control your guys, but if you use a Wii Remote and Nunchuck, you can aim around the screen in a way that just wouldn't be possible with a regular controller alone. Or more recently, look at ARMS. The Pro Controller works fine, but mastering the motion controls puts you at an advantage because you can curve your punches. But with Odyssey, the motion controls do nothing to enhance the experience. Some people like the physical, tactile sensation of moving their arms around and having that translate into the game, but again, that should not be forced on anybody. This isn't Wii Sports, where the point is moving around. This is Mario, where the point is enjoyable and accurate platforming. Odyssey's biggest sin here is that providing button alternatives for all of these motion-controlled actions would be exceptionally easy. They could patch the change in tomorrow if they felt like it. Okay, look, here, watch. A and B both jump and X and Y both throw Cappy. How about you tap Y once to throw, once again to home, and a third time to spin? Wah, bam, you home in on something. Ba, ba, bam, you're spinning, just like that. Then you hit X to throw Cappy up and B to throw Cappy down. If you want to jump X extra high or whatever while controlling a capture, map the move to X. There, I just did it. I just fixed the game and made it possible for anyone to enjoy in any position and with any play style, all while still only using the face buttons. I know a lot of people don't mind this whole thing, and I'm way happy for them. And I'm also sorry that I'm annoying them by talking about this so much, as apparently a lot of them tend to believe anybody with the issue is objectively wrong. But a lot of other people feel the same way I do. All of my Switch-owning friends are grumbling about it. One of them bought the game and is just trying to deal with the controls, and the others are having second thoughts about getting it at all. One of them plays his Switch almost exclusively in handheld mode, so he's not even sure if it's worth the hassle of swinging his system around or missing out on a bunch of moves that make the game more fun. Say what you will about lazy, entitled, overreacting gamers, whatever, but it isn't a crime to want to be comfortable when you play, and for many people, this is just not comfortable. And again, just because you think it's fine, it doesn't mean these people are making it up. <sighs> Look, this would be much more forgivable coming from any other, less monumental game. Or, like I said, if these controls literally did anything to actually enhance the experience, to do something not otherwise possible with just sticks and buttons. But with Super Mario Odyssey, the biggest, most content-packed Mario ever, made all the more amazing by the fact that we can play it on the go, it's inexcusable. I want the handheld experience to be just as fun, and just not using these moves, as many like to suggest, makes the game less fun, period. Nothing so simple and above all avoidable should be present to mar a game this special, this important. And now allow me to elaborate on the problem further for another 20 minutes. No, just kidding. That's it for what I would call the straight up bad stuff, but here's some softer and uh, more brief criticism. You've got kingdoms, which are wonderfully designed with lots to do, yada yada yada. Then you've got those bonus stages that function more like a traditional linear Mario, where platforming is more often the focus. These are naturally where the tightest technical design comes into play, but I would say that they're not as expertly crafted as most stages from, say, Galaxy or 3D World. And the size of this problem depends on who you are. For platforming aficionados, this will come as a disappointment. For folks like me, who place more value on all of the other good stuff, not so much. Now, don't get me wrong, I do appreciate a good platforming level, and I would enjoy some tighter and more clever design here. These stages were Nintendo's chance to have their cake and eat it too, to please fans of both types of Marios. Not going all out on them is something of a missed opportunity, though I have to wonder if allowing for such freedom of movement made tighter design uh, difficult. Additionally, I think the bosses could have been better overall. I humongously appreciate that we got these rabbit dudes instead of Koopalings or something equally plain, and the game's boss battles are certainly fun. There are a few that just blew me away visually. But, I don't know, they just could have been better, more interesting mechanically, especially considering how many new moves Mario's got. Galaxy 1 and 2 especially had some really grand, really creative bosses. 
but Odysseys just don't quite hit that mark in most cases. It feels like most of the work went into the world and the bosses were maybe secondary. These are a few reasons that while I think Odyssey is a masterpiece and it's already become one of my all time favorite games, it's not all that it could be. It's not like it's as good as a Mario game can possibly get. And it's funny because it's a lot like Breath of the Wild in this way. Both games are exciting new titles on Nintendo's exciting new hardware, they do exciting new things and are overall just blowing people away with how stupidly amazing they are but they both have a lot of room for improvement. And really, when you think about it, that's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with doing something new and then improving on it later. That's exactly how games and sequels work, actually. And as I often say with great games containing elements that don't live up to their potential, that in fact only makes me more excited for future titles. This game is amazing times a thousand, but it's just begging for an even better sequel. But let's hit on just a few more topics before wrapping up this review. Music and sound. Like any Mario, Odyssey is very easy on the ears. The varied and fantastical elements of the game world bleed into the tunes. You've got a wide assortment of different styles. I will say that the music too often takes a back seat for my liking. It is, once again, much like Breath of the Wild in that way. There are some areas where I can spend hours running around, and when I leave, I can't for the life of me remember what the music was like. However, there are definitely a handful of standout tracks that pass the Do I Hum It Later test with flying colors. Often I feel like the most interesting music is in secret stages rather than in the main areas. One cool thing though, if you've got a favorite track, you can access it from the song menu at any time and have it play for as long as you want. Why don't more games let you do that? As far as general sound design goes, it's great. Sound effects all sound good, though is it just me or do Mario's footsteps not quite match his footfalls when he's running at full speed? Huh. I don't know. Anyway, if there's one sound related thing that really jumps out at me, it's the voices. Mario's tried just having text, often with little vocalizations to punctuate lines, and it's tried having voice acting, though this time it's hit something of a middle ground, at least with cutscenes, that I think is perfect. Whenever certain characters are talking to you, they speak in a kind of gibberish language, and it's actually been recorded to fit each line, rather than being compiled from randomized sounds, Midna or Banjo Kazooie style. <laughs> This makes it feel like they're actually talking without bringing a bunch of real words into the mix, which I'm not a big fan of with this type of game. So by now we know that the game is phenomenal. The worlds are great, the gameplay is great, the music is great, the controls are mostly great. But what about the end game? What about when you've collected enough moons to get to the last kingdom and beat the last boss? Well, my friends, Nintendo undoubtedly knew that they had something special on their hands because this is yet another way that Super Mario Odyssey soars above its predecessors. Like I said earlier, getting every star or shine in 64 and sunshine was a big chore. And in both cases, between the credits and the time when you nabbed your very last thing and the game gave you your tiny little prize, there was nothing. There were no other rewards, no real motivator outside of, hey, it would be cool to get everything. But holy pants, Odyssey knows how to keep you playing. The problem here is that I don't want to spoil anything. I'm actually considering doing an entire video on the endgame itself, maybe touching on a few of the other elements I couldn't talk about here for spoiler reasons. Kind of a sequel review for people who have played the game, so let me know down in the comments if that's something you'd like to see. But anyway, I'll just say that the game continues to reward you as you continue to collect moons. It motivates you, it keeps you engaged. And this is great, of course, because of the fact that, as you know, there are a million moons to get. The result is not only the funnest Mario ever, but the most content packed and replayable. And for a guy like me who already cherishes the admittedly vastly inferior 64 and Sunshine and replays them at least once every one or two years, this means the world. You see, to me, there are great games and there are special games. There are games that I love, that I think are expertly crafted, that I even give perfect scores to. But then there are the ones that I want to play again and again, the memories of which I carry with me forever. I suppose it's a little too early to say if the experience of playing Odyssey for the first time will be with me just as strongly when I'm 50, but I already know it's something I'm not going to want to stop playing for years to come. Nintendo's just got this way of making games that aren't just new games that we play and it's great and we move on to the next thing. Particularly when you're talking about flagship franchises like Mario and Zelda, they make games that really stick around. For big fans like myself, Nintendo games don't just pass pass by on a conveyor belt, one after the other. It's more like they feed into a well. Replayability is such a big thing with their games that the library doesn't cycle, it grows. And a title like Super Mario Odyssey is a big, permanent addition to that library. It's one that begs for the gaming world to dig into it, talk about it, master it, and return to it many times. And yes, that's what makes the motion control thing so much harder to forgive. 
The game is such an achievement that any problem so avoidable is all the more baffling and disappointing. But look past that though, and you've got yourself the most creative, exciting, ambitious, beautiful, and, for a fan of sandboxes like me, fun Mario game ever created. One that sets the bar so high stylistically that it's hard to imagine where the series will go next. It's not the most perfect and amazing game possible from a design standpoint. If you're looking for intricately crafted platforming levels, you're better off going back and playing Galaxy 2. And to be honest, if you watch too many of the game's trailers, it probably won't rise above the hype Nintendo built in your head. I went in hoping that it would surprise me by being bigger than it looked, but it's not. Nintendo showed us just about everything the game has to offer, which is a big issue that again, we'll talk about later, but even just meeting my hype and expectations is still a big accomplishment considering how high they were set by those trailers. Just as I knew would probably be the case after that fateful night back in January, playing this game is pure joy. It's like being in a gigantic fantasy playground with something delightful around every corner. And because of that, it's my new happy place. When life's getting me down and I wanna just be happy and be enjoying something, I can pop it on in a few seconds and fill up that joy meter. I think it's probably no surprise to anyone that Super Mario Odyssey gets a seven out of seven. Woo, thanks for that, man. I really appreciate it. I did not believe it to be possible, but that review was so long, I very nearly died. Okay, so I know you're not really into bartering and all that, but there's just gotta be something I can do for you to return me to my body again. There is, mortal. Wow, really? <laughs> I'm kind of surprised it was that easy again. I, I thought you'd prefer to harvest my soul or whatever. You'll be back again when Pikmin or Metroid Prime 4 comes out. Yeah, good point. So what is it? What have I got to do? I believe you know what it is. Oh, uh, and I don't suppose you want to be cappy, do you? Nope. All right, fine, but you're making popcorn or something first. Dying makes me hungry. A very special game like Super Mario Odyssey calls for a very special Patreon shoutout. I am immensely thankful for every single one of my patrons. In these trying times of YouTube advertiser shenanigans, your continued support keeps this channel running. But you see those guys right up there? Those are my top patrons, and they have my deepest, most uncomfortably intense thanks. So I want to shout out Zakanuva. You're my number one contributor, and I love you, buddy. Evan, you got a great face on you. Deontay, that's a really good name. Aiden Lopez, don't even get me started on Aiden Lopez. Ben Ben, unquestionably my number one fan. Scott Pompeo, wherever did you get that marvelous top hat? Bleeding Ink, can you hook me up with a Samus tattoo? Maybe like right across my chest or something. Maximus, are you not entertained? Bill True Love, I could use some uh, relationship advice again some time later. Fruit Jackal, obviously a very hoopy Frood. Seth Reich, you're beautiful! Dr. Raskotnik, go check out his reviews and stuff on Wizard Dojo, it's really excellent. Video Fever, if that fever persists, you should really go see a doctor. Shadow Minion, creeping in the shadows even as we speak, no doubt. Heroic Teddy, hey buddy! Gavin Feasel, okay, you have to tell me who does your hair. Two Holmes, you are simply a marvelous human being. Andy Sturton, you are equally marvelous. Hikarion Koku, I'll figure out the secret recipe to your gumbo someday. Nathan Steele, we'll figure out the secret recipe to Hikarion Koku's gumbo someday. Grampy, your beard is glorious, I can only assume. Showbiz Network, how you doing today? And Joe Pro, go check him out on YouTube. 10 trillion thanks to all you fine folks and you have yourself a grand day.